everyone, my name's Rebecca, I'm an ichthyologist, I'm also a PhD student studying the evolution of lower colored catfishes, so that's Becca's, but today we're going to talk about something entirely different, I'm going to talk about discus, which I'm going to be a bit general here because I'm going to talk about some physodon, which is the genus. Um, there's three recognised species in Physodon Tarsu, which is like Peruvian side. They're known as the greens usually. There's in Physodon um, Discus, which is the heckles. There's in Physodon Aquafasciatus, which is probably, what, is it more widespread? Um, it's most genetically similar to actually um, heckles. Uh, then it, they're not even, like, neither are that closely related to the um, Tarsu. And that's the blues. There is um, some undescribed species. There's one in the Rio Zingu, known as the Zingu discus, and there's potentially a few others. So discus diets are very um, well misunderstood, and there's not actually that much about what they eat in the wild. Because I guess there's so much... Well, when you're looking at feeding a fish, a lot of people look at or think about aquaculture, so look at efficiency. But very few look at what these animals feed in the wild. And there's actually only one paper I found really on the topic, and I've dissected a few more aquaculture style papers. So a lot of people will traditionally think of uh, discus as insectivores, as carnivores, which it really doesn't replicate their morphology at all. If you look at the head of them, the mouth, it's mostly a lot of paku. And while it's probably not bony structures that are so important like in lower carids, these guys probably are very similar to uh, paku in using their so very solid lip structure to get into what they're grazing on. And these fish are probably constantly grazing. Uh, when they're not doing sort of more social activities, you can kind of think of them as more like cows, horses, so they're just grazers, they're constantly feeding. But they're actually quite complex in a lot of their feeding methods, and I'm only going to talk about adults feeding because obviously juveniles is a whole nother topic. There's a whole load of sets of papers on how juveniles feed and why and what, uh, which juveniles when they're involved with the parents. So, these fish actually don't eat, they're not actually carnivores in the wild. Um, a lot of people in captivity will feed them beef heart, uh, duck heart, chicken heart, very high protein, high fat, high muscular sort of ingredients. Uh, fish meals, they want a very high percentage of protein. And this is very hit and miss and I think it's very vaguely looking at protein. And especially when it comes to mussels, which are very high in diaminase and deficient in thiamine. But today I'm going to talk about what these fish in the eat in the wild and what could be a beneficial diet. So this paper actually looked at some fights on heraldi. And I didn't include that in my list of species because this is no longer an accepted species. So in fights on heraldi, um, when look at the scientific analysis, these were known as the brown discus, by the way. And I believe... They're the ones that are quite similar to the um, well, red covers, that's it. But this species has now been split up um, into multiples and potentially one undescribed species. Um, split up as in the actual specimens of fish that were thought to be in that species are now placed in others. These ones come from a blackwater habitat in the Tefi region. Um, which is, I think, Peru. So maybe these were symbiotic or are symbiosed on Tarzu, but it's impossible to say particularly uh, which ones it is without, I guess, pictures and actually having the specimens to hand. But either way, discus, they're feeding on the same thing. To, um, symbiosed on not many species, not much morphological diversity. They're, I think they're very recently diverged anyway. So, the large majority of this diet is not carnivorous at all. So it's around sort of, I'd say, 60-50% um, of their diet during the dry season is periplankton, largely referring to algae, but also fine detritus, which could be other types of algae, bacteria, rhizo, which are animals, but it's a very different feeding mechanism, Sp potentially sponges, I don't know, maybe other types of detritus, so plant waste, um, 
stuff like that. And that actually rises to around 80% during the wet season, where that makes up almost entirely of their diet anyway during the dry season, it makes up even more during the wet season. This could be partially due to availability, access to certain nutrients, um, so that's why it's kind of a bit more um, complex because you do these are more seasonal fishes I guess and it would depend where they originate to how much season they're getting. So what about the next part of their diet? Well in the wet season they get next to none of this, very little, what like 3% uh, or so. But during the low season, the sort of dry season, they're getting um, around, what would that be, about 15%, 10% uh, of their diet will include this coarse organic detritus. And this largely refers to wood and bark. Does that mean they're digesting it? Probably not. But that probably means that that's where they're trying to access their food. It doesn't mean it's needed in their digestion, the same for oral cars. It's probably where they're getting their food. They might be moving from certain habitats to another habitat where they're feeding off the wood rather than feeding off other structures. Um, there could be a whole load of different reasons for this. So that really makes it around 80% of their diet-ish, give or take. And there are um, sort of what's it, standard deviation bars for this, um, error bars actually. Oh no, standard deviation. So there is variation between individuals. Um, so the sort of the largest, so some individuals are eating a lot more than others and there's a lot more standard deviation than particularly that low water season it seems. So there's a lot more variation between individuals I'd say. But that makes it around, let's just say, 80% of their diet is that detritus and algae. So that means I would classify them as a detritivore, which are they're feeding on waste, they're feeding on invertebrates, well, sort of like bryozoa and invertebrates, because it does actually go into what other invertebrates they would be eating, but stuff like bacteria also, which aren't invertebrates, they're prokaryotes maybe archaea, sponges, um, all sorts of different sort of organisms, um, plant, maybe pl a bit of plant matter but that would be included in just general detritus because the, their habitats aren't like meadows of grass, they're not, nothing like that, it's really difficult to explain. So the next part of their diet is um, the contrastica, which I wasn't sure until I've never seen that term mentioned, but basically these are like, oh, what's it? They're basically small crustaceans. Um, they look like uh, mollusks, they're not. Um, I think clam shrimp is one of their common names. But this is when it starts going into actual invertebrates, and this, these only make up in the, all of these invertebrates apart from one, are, tend to be higher in that dry season but these guys they eat more of them are about, at around what 10% um, only during that dry season the low water season and this might just be due to access um, or this might be when these things are breeding they're breeding at that certain season because that's more suitable to get food and resources Next, decapods, that's, I always think, more crabs, but I'd assume there's other organisms that are very similar um, in that category. Um, that's around sort of 5%, a little bit higher during the um, wet season. There's more standard deviation, there's more variation between how much they're eating in that low water season. Ostracods are very, very little, what, 3%? Um, Coleoptera larvae. Interestingly, this is a, and Coleoptera larvae, that sort of beetles, so Coleoptera is yeah. beetles, they're eating some of their larvae at a, sort of around, let's say 10%-ish, and only really during that um, dry season. So, and then the last one, chromatid larvae, that's your bloodworm, stuff like that. 
about 10%. So this, obviously, my numbers are not adding up entirely because it's a chart um, I'm reading. But it's just quite interesting to look at um, what they're actually feeding on. Um, and so little of this, what they're really feeding on is um, so little of what they're actually feeding on is actually invertebrates as in animal invertebrates it does specify though that um, so you'll see on the screen anyway if I've managed to include the thing that um, so it's very difficult to separate the uh, periplankton, the fine organic detritus and the green, um, uh, what's it, the green plant matter. And this green plant matter was a very small volume of this category, only 15%. So that would be macrophytes. So they're not actually eating that many plants, that they're eating more algae than they are eating plants. So that would mean that I would very, because it's such a small percentage and I would not really be looking at feeding particularly that much um, plant matter, vegetable matter, maybe very little, but they're going to struggle to digest it because of the cellulose, they're not adapted for actually feeding on plants. So this got, I will include the link to this paper anyway if you want to read and dissect it because it's got really interesting mentions to the, um, not just the diet but the behaviour of discus in the wild, how they show. Um, there's other papers that, too on the sociality of discus but it's very interesting to see how they do it in the wild and it does compare to other species I think this one does um, where they're show these guys are showing in groups of thousands unless they're breeding they don't live that long in the wild um, which cichlids uh, I don't think do have particularly great lifespans anyway um, and then the shoals of angelfish being much, much less, and then other cichlid, social cichlids in the same sort of range, if you get what I mean. So the next diet, uh, because obviously one of the most popular algae, and it is a cyanobacteria, and algae are a common name. So it doesn't actually have to be with common names. They're kind of your own interpretation in a way. Um, but uh, cyanobacteria so are a type of algae. Spirulina is one of the most popular to feed. It is a superfood. It's very high in protein. It's very um, high in loads of many vitamins and minerals. But so are all algae, really. So this is one of the most popular um, to use. I don't find it popular in fishes. It smells, but most algae should smell. Um, so this paper. So another paper looked at. Um, feeding spirulina. Spirulina did actually result, and this is the only paper I think that I could find reliable comparing the use of algae. So it's only one algae, but spirulina resulted in the highest food conversion ratio, so it was digested much better than um, the other parts of the diet, and I think that was like uh, beef heart and stuff, but go on the paper, read it, double check. Um, Spirulina resulted in a higher survival rate than the other diets tried. The coloration was better with spirulina and xanthin. Xanthin is actually a pigment or um, I think it comes in a lot of algae, it's originally from bacteria, but um, it's involved, it, gave, it aids with that red coloration. So don't use with yellow discus, you're going to lose that yellow coloration, it's going to go more pink. But with red discus, it will bring out the colours or any discus where you want those red pigments to really shine, or any fish really. Um, and then there's another one, xan, xan, xanthophyll, um, and color, increased coloration when it was added to a diet, but decreased growth. Um, but that's a very simplistic look, and I think a lot of these aquaculture papers are very simplistic and you have to extract things. It's looking for a particular thing, you're looking for efficiency, um, but you're not looking for long-term care. And then, for some reason, oh, I have got the link to this paper. There's another one, so I decided to look up, um, well, research high protein levels. 
As expected, high protein levels are shown to increase growth, but this study actually, the only difference was, the in, um, was an increase in the amount of casein, which is a phosphoprotein found in mammalian milk, and a decrease in the amount of cornstarch, which is like a filler. So there might be a few other interactions, and if you look at the discussion um, of the paper or the results, and there's probably more look into it. They never actually increased um, the uh, amount of beef heart, duck heart, or shrimp heart um, within each diet. So really, it obviously, although the percentage doesn't increase for those in the diet, they're feeding more of it because they're going to feed probably the same volume of food. But maybe we ne there needs to be a bit more looking at the different types of proteins. Um, because algae produce, and what they're feeding on in the wild, um, which is the periplankton, which is more algae than they are feeding on plants, that we need to look at very different proteins, very different amino acids to what's actually in, uh, produced by animals. And this might affect digestion, growth in a different way, um, also coloration, um, and longevity, health of the fish. So really look at the different amino acids, because when you research it, you'll find out that different Sources have different amino acids that build up different proteins and protein percentage isn't the main thing because if you only go by protein percentage you're only looking at this vague measure rather than looking at what proteins and what amino acids because these fish have precise enzymes, precise bacteria that they can, har uh, well, they can produce, harvest, farm in the digestive tract that will only work on certain bacteria, certain um, only work on certain amino acids, um, and the efficiency of them on different amino acids will really vary. So I think I've explained that enough. Uh, look at feeding them like a little curd, loads of algae would be great if you can get them to feed on it. This because are very fussy in the world, they're probably feeding on a the surface that and they like things to move a little bit which does make them quite difficult to feed on it a uh, feed in a way but thank you for watching and if you like my video please comment like subscribe um i'm happy to answer any questions or if you have any video ideas just tell me anyway thank you for watching